nearly joined you in the clapping then, which would have been a bit too uh, presumptuous that I'm going to be any good. But thank you, Jan. Uh, myself and Jan go way back, not as far as you'd probably think, but we're, uh, we're mutual bantams. We're Bradford City fans, so, uh, and, uh, and journalists is our trade. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for welcoming me to uh, Trinity and All Saints College, or TASC, as, uh, is it still known as TASC, I presume? Yeah, yeah. So I was in, the, in this auditorium not so long ago, maybe 10 or 11 years ago, when I was training to be a, a journalist as well. So thanks for having me. So it's a very sort of interactive um, speech that I do, if you can call it a speech. As the title suggests, uh, it's from press box to boardroom. So I sympathize with a lot of you in terms of um, what you're going through at the moment, studying to be the next generation of journalists, because as I mentioned, I was once studying to be a journalist and then thankfully became a journalist and then specialized in sport. I was a sports billy at school, so sport was always my thing. But in the last year, I've, uh, I've held the position of Chief Operating Officer um, at Bradford City Football Club. Yes, the world's greatest football team. I think the apostrophe S is right. Is that right? Yeah, should be. I should know these things, but even uh, us uh, hacks, young um, and seasoned, get these things wrong, don't they, Jan? Because I see it. You see it all the time. There's not a, there's not a football programme in the country that isn't littered with errors. Um, but listen, before we start, um, will that scroll down? Yes. Uh, we'll be taking questions at the end. Um, as I understand, the speaker's just uh, answered some of your questions. And if you haven't got a question now, that's not a problem. But if you haven't got a question at the end, either I've done something wrong or you're in the wrong profession because uh, it's your job to ask questions, whether it's at a press conference, whether it's interviewing an MP, whether it's interviewing, I don't know, um, a lawyer or anything. You know, the job is to ask questions. We're inquisitive beasts by nature, uh, journalists and human beings, so um, ask some questions. And there'll be prizes, and they might be uh, fun, they might be football related, but you've got to be in it to win it, as someone very famously once said on a cheap game show that's probably on Channel 5 now. Right then, so a bit about me, a bit of background. So, James Mason, age 37, I'm married with two children. I didn't always want to be a journalist, I always wanted to be... Um, well, an astronaut first and foremost, but uh, my career's advisors weren't particularly uh, um, you know, helpful in that respect and didn't think I'd ever make it. So uh, I wanted to be a footballer next. They, weren't, they were equally uh, unhelpful with that. They said, you've no chance of being a footballer, you're rubbish. And then I thought, well, I go watch Bradford City most weeks. What do, they, what do those men and women do up there in the press box? Oh, they're right about the, the football match and they get paid to do so they're on the radio. That'll do me. I can do that. I can speak all day long. You know, I love the sound of my own voice. Who doesn't? Uh, well, not everyone, James. You know, everyone's as, uh, as, as rude at cla in class as you. Um, so you're not going to be a journalist because, A, you're not clever enough. You don't listen enough. And because there's far more uh, uh, better students out there that are better with the written word than you and so on and so forth. So guess what? I gave up on that and uh, I went to work in sales after I finished university like uh, most people do, because we didn't get the careers advice that we should get these days, which is crack on, do what you want to do. You know, if you want to be a journalist, if you want to be an astronaut, if you want to be a professional footballer, Asterix, you've got to have some sort of talent for that. But, you know, it was too easy for, uh, for me at school to 16 to sort of follow into a path that everyone else, else went into. I went to Newcastle University to do a degree in um, philosophy and psychology uh, because I wanted to get pissed for three years, basically. Um, and I thought, ah, psychology, I can probably make that up along the way. And philosophy, well, yeah, once I've had a few pints, I'll probably be pretty good at it anyway. So <laughs> let's do something that's quite generic. But journalism was always gnawing away at me because, as I said at the start, we're inquisitive by nature. You're all here because you've got a passion for news or sport or politics or something that gets you. It might be music. Some of my friends are music journalists. Some are sports journalists. Some of the best job in the world, they're travel journalists. They've got something about them and they go, do you know what? I don't just want to learn a little bit about this. I want to go live it. I want to, you know, emerge myself in it. Just completely talk about it, write about it, present about it. Just be it effectively. And for me, it was sport. So after I'd done three years at university, um, studying psychology and philosophy, I thought, right, I'm going to go around the world. I'm going to just see a bit more about the world. Um, and I had a bucket list, which was basically go to the Olympics, go to a World Cup, go watch cricket in South Africa, go watch rugby in New Zealand, go to watch football in Mexico, etc. And all these things I wanted to do. So I got three of my best pals and uh, we decided, listen, that's what we'll do. So we worked for a year. 
Uh, I worked just in a bar and at a golf club, just earning money. And we got enough money together to go and uh, travel the world. And this is when I really knew that sports journalism was for me, because we went to the Olympics in Sydney, which was fantastic, one of the best Olympics games that ever, ever were. And I was mixing with other journalists and saying, you know, how do you get into this? How do you, how do you get to become what you are, following sport around the world? Um, and I started some amateur, not blogging, because, you know, back in 2000, blogging wasn't, well, I don't think blogging existed really, did it? So what it was was just emailing. So I'd email my mum, my dad, my friends and family, my sisters, etc., and say, guess what I've done today? Went to the Olympic Games. I saw Steve Redgrave win his fifth gold medal. I saw, um, I saw, um, oh, I've forgotten the name. That's how good I am. Uh, Australia, Australian runner, 400 meter runner. Um, she, she won her event and then all these other events. And before you knew it, friends and family would be getting back to me saying, oh, really fun email. Tell us about uh, what you're doing tomorrow, this, that, and the other. So the emails kept on becoming longer and longer. And a bit of a narrative of what I was doing as I went around the world. So Australia was the Olympics, New Zealand to go watch some rugby uh, union, um, cricket in South Africa, all these wonderful, beautiful places that you get to go and you know, visit as a, as, a, as a sports commentator or a sports enthusiast or just a travel writer or just generally in life. Moved on to New Zealand, as I mentioned. We went out to Hawaii to do some skydiving, which was fantastic. Went to Mexico and toured around Mexico. Went to the Aztec Stadium, which is where uh, Mexico play their national games, world's biggest football stadium, so that's a big tick. Uh, and then moved on to New York, where we watched some American football. And then came back and had the horrible realisation that life's about to start now. I've had a bit of fun. I've had a year around the world. I've had three years at university. And I'm still not really sure what I want to do because I really want to be a journalist, but all I have is passion. You know, I don't have any writing skills. I don't have shorthand. I don't have any of the skills that you need. Um, and hopefully what you'll get from this journalism week is that, you know, all those skills are very, very important. And ultimately, when it comes down to what you need, you need the nuts and bolts of being a journalist, whether it be shorthand, whether it be media law, whether it's to know when or not to put that into a quote or into your, or into your written piece or your news package. Um, but I just kept names and numbers of all the people I'd met along the way, all these journalists. Uh, one of them was John Helm, who none of you will probably know, but he's, uh, he's now the most famous sports commentator in India. He covers the uh, Indian Premier League, but he used to work for Calendar News, he's worked for BBC Television, and he's one of the nicest people that you'll ever meet on the planet. And that's a big skill, because when you're typing uh, emails in the next few weeks and months for work experience, you're going to get a lot of non-replies, you're going to get a lot of no's, we're too busy, we're going to get a lot of, um, listen, come back next year's. And John was the first person who said to me, James, I'll give you a chance, come and watch a game with me, come and, come and see how I do it. I'm not saying I'm very good at it, but he must have been, but he's very uh, self-assuming and just said, listen, come and, come and see how I do it. And the one skill I learned from John was that he was the most passionate man about what he does more than anybody else. If there was a statistic, he knew it. If there was a, a goal that was scored back in 1972 by a left back that you'd never heard of, he knew it because it was just him. It's what he did. So whether he was working or whether he was at home with his friends or his children or his wife or his friends, he would be talking about Colchester United's result last week or um, how wonderful uh, Japan's defeat of uh, South Africa was in the World Cup because it was just it was in, it was in him. And he gave me the opportunity to come to a game and, uh, and, and shadow him effectively and see what it was all about, the world of, of sports journalism, to see if it was for me. And it was for me straight away, which was good. I thought, that's what I want to do, John. How do I get more of this? And he said, well, experience will get you so far. Um, enthusiasm, yep, you've got that, James, in abundance. You love it. That's going to get you a long way because you're going to get lots of no's. You're going to get lots of knockbacks. You're going to get lots of hard luck stories. Not this time. But what you do need is some sort of professional qualification. Um, and it used to be the route, I presume, Jan, that you would go to journalism college, you'd learn shorthand, uh, your English had to be good, but basically learning on the job. Going out to the Telegraph and Argus, the Yorkshire Evening Post, uh, getting some sort of internship, and then it going from there. Um, well, when I started looking around for jobs, specifically in radio and television, because that's what I wanted to do, I wanted to do the radio side of things. I, I find it a very creative medium. Um, as I mentioned, my, my English written English is no better than the next person's, but you know my ability to sort of transgress what was happening on the pitch seemed to be a skill that was suited to me. So I looked at courses and guess what? On my doorstep, 
been based in Geisley in between Leeds and Bradford was Trinity and All Saints University. Perfect. A journalism college whereby, uh, you know, you can study journalism and there you go, you're nailed on, you're going to get a job with the Times the following week, aren't you? And then uh, work for the Observer and then be the BBC News correspondent and then go to World Cups and it'd be a piece of cake. Well, it didn't work like that. But I got a place on the course. Uh, Richard Horsman, still here, I presume? Yeah, yeah, we all know, we all know Richard. Hello. Uh, we all know Richard. Yeah, I met with Richard, had an interview like you all would have done, checked the grades out, and I was given a, co a place on the course the following uh, January. Did it still go January to January? Something like that. Yeah, something similar. So I had a year to work in industry, which was basically just get as much experience as I could, ringing radio leads up, ringing the Pulse, ringing the Telegraph and Argus, ringing uh, the Yorkshire Post up. Hi, guys, I'm the next big thing. I'm going to be the next big journalist. You need me to come and do work experience with you. Oh, yeah, James, uh, we'll put you on the list of 300 others. Uh, we'll, give, we'll give you a call. So it was a little bit tough forthcoming, but the, the course itself was brilliant. You know, it taught me the nuts and bolts of, of, of what it meant to be a journalist and, uh, and, and what we would need going forward, the skills that we would need, but also the contacts, the people that you meet, and also a career path. Um, so that's where, uh, in a roundabout way, how I got into sort of sports journalism. So that's got me to college, as it were. That got me to Trinity and All Saints. Uh, which is, I suppose, where you're at now. So hopefully the, the rest of the conversation and, 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 and talk will be relevant and pertinent because, you know, very quickly, I'm back here. Only 10 years ago, I was studying, you know, doing um, all sorts of work, trying to get myself the best position I could put myself in to get a job, which was, yeah, get a good qualification, have as much experience as I could, know as many people, because goodness me, you're all going to meet each other in various walks of life. You know, some of you will go to London, some of you will stay local, some of you will go abroad, some of you will just stay in your house blogging or doing what you do, you know, because it's, it's changed. But you'll all come in touch with each other. And at some point, one of you, it might be you asking you, it might be you asking you, is there a job going? Or have you thought about this? I've got a piece I want to write. I've stumbled across a story. Um, and people move on to, you know, do pretty impressive things. So if I just look through this booklet, for example, there's quite a few people that I, di I didn't study with, but that came here. So you've got Jason McCartney tomorrow afternoon, who uh, <laughs> I'd love to watch his talk because he went from the army, I think, or the RAF, to be a sports journalist, to, uh, yeah, work for ITV, and now he's an MP, isn't he, I think? Yeah, MP for the Colm Valley. So he's done pretty much everything as Jason. So if I have half the career he has, I've done all right. But um, So keep in touch with everyone, and this is a great place to sort of learn your training ground. Um, Roots into sports journalism, as I mentioned. I left here with a generic by media degree. Um, I presume you're all doing print, is that right? Mixture? Mixture? Okay. Okay, a bit of everything. So that's brilliant. So I came to it late. So I did the, uh, an undergraduate in psychology and philosophy and then did the postgraduate diploma in, in journalism. There was no specific sports module of it. It was just journalism, media law, et cetera as I mentioned, the sort of core basic skills, and then specialised into sport. So why sport for me? Because I, do, because I did it, because I love it, because it's what I talked about. As I mentioned, it could be music, it could be anything. But the key principles were there regardless on the course. You know, the what, the why, the who, the where and the can, uh, the where and the when. And that was something that uh, Richard Horsman drilled into us very quickly. You know, he said, if you, know the, if you can get these five answers, out, or if you can build a story around these five principles, you'll be all right, your story will be something like it. You know, what's happening, why is it happening, who's involved, who are the protagonists, where is it happening, when, if, if literally you put that down and fill the blanks in, add the meat to the bones, you, you, you're pretty much there with, with the basis of a story. But going forward and hopefully what these talks will give you over the next few days is, you know, what can we learn, I suppose, from our own journalism training that could affect our careers? And I think it's quite pertinent because, you know, what are we doing? You know, what is journalism? Is it the pursuit of, you know, the truth and all this and the other? Maybe, but often it's just, you know, a generic interest in something or, or building up a story base. So you're the story now. You know, it's all about you and it's where your career's going to go next. Why are you doing it? Because you're passionate. You've chosen this over all these other myriad of possible courses that you could have done. You've, you've chosen journalism. Who? Going back to the person, it's, it's about you, you're the individual, but who are you going to meet on the way? You know, if you're a budding journalist now, you're going to meet some wonderful people, some crazy people. When I worked at uh, BBC Radio Sunderland, I covered stories from um, a bespoke funeral director 
who uh, turned up on a Harley Davidson and wheeled people to church on the back of it. I interviewed uh, cheese farmers on National Cheese Day, which I didn't even know existed. Uh, I interviewed John Prescott, who was then the deputy uh, leader of the Labour Party, about the Northern Way, which was a big thing uh, back in the sort of early turn of the century. So you're going to meet some really interesting people. I've, I've interviewed um, prime ministers. I've interviewed England football managers. I've interviewed murderers. Uh, I've interviewed um, celebrities, politicians, you name it. You're going to meet, you're going to meet, meet the lot. Um, and there's often a fine line with, between them all, to be honest. Um, the where, 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 where's the job going to take you? It's going to start here in Leeds, but you're probably from all over the country. You're probably from all over the world these days. Um, and my journalism's taken me all over the country, but to some extent, parts of the world. I've done sp uh, some work in Dubai. I've done bits of work in Australia. And I still count the work that I did as a budding um, emailer in Australia as work. You know, it was, it, was, it was the start of me sort of building interesting emails and stories and learning how, you know, I suppose the word flair would come into it. What, what suits you? What do people like? What do people want to read? What, do they, what excites them? What makes them tick? And they'll soon tell you as well. Um, and the when, you know, when's it happening? When, when should you be doing things? When do you get your work experience now? How much do you get? As much as you can, as varied as you can. Um, and that will happen throughout your, your life. I often think a journalist is, uh, is often uh, an apprentice throughout the whole life. You never really do stop learning, which is cliched, but you might learn different styles. You might learn different um, um, pinch points. You might learn different ways to ask questions and so on and so forth. So when is crucial, it's, it's going to be ongoing for you. Okay. So what's going to make you different from Dean or Jan or me? Um, a simple answer is you, you know, pretty much. Um, I I'm not going to get uh, all um, genetic on you, but literally we're all different. Our fingerprints are different. Our makeup's different. What's different between me and you is that I might want it more than you. You might want it more than me, but when all 50 of you go for a job in a few years, uh, the thing that's going to separate you from everybody else is the fact that you probably want it more than the next person. And when we go on to some of the key ingredients, which are down here, persistence, passion, determination, I'll tell you what, if Dean tells you, if Jan tells you, if Richard tells you, if Jason tells you when he's in tomorrow, or anybody else, you are in a very privileged position here to be on this course, but if you do go on and become a journalist, which you will do, you're in a very privileged position. You are the person that has direct access to ask the questions that the listener, the viewer, wants to ask. So look at the big news stories that we've had over this weekend. You know, there'll be certain people, Hugh Edwards, for example, presenting from uh, Paris last night, will be asking world leaders what they're going to do, why they're going to do it, who they're going to do it with, when they're going to do it. So, you know, if you do make it, and you will make it, it's going to be a very privileged um, existence for you. But to get there, you will need to be a little bit different to the person next to you, a little bit different to the person behind you, uh, but you will need some key, you will need some key personality traits such as persistence, passion, um, determination. Oh, persistence again, there it is. Um, because, you know, as I mentioned before, when I started at 16 and thought that I might have an inkling as to what I want to do, um, you know, people are there to say, you're not going to do it, James. You know, you, you're not a 3A student. You're not um, the brightest, um, uh, you know, in, in the classroom. You're not the sharpest tool in the toolbox. I didn't like that one, actually. Uh, because uh, I mean, I was a bit thick or a bit dim, but what they were getting at was they were trying to chip you down, and I kept on thinking, no, I'm going to do this, I want this, I've got that, I've got the passion, I've definitely got the determination, so now it's persistence. I remember the first job I ever got was for a radio station called Real Radio that I know still exists, I think they're called Real Radio Yorkshire now, and um, they asked me to do a job on a Tuesday night down in uh, East London at a football ground called Sellers Park that Crystal Palace play at. Any football fans before we go any further? Any sports fans? Any Crystal Palace fans? Ever been to Sellers Park? Hardest ground in the world to get to? Yeah. On a Tuesday night, when you live in Bradford and you don't drive and you've no money and uh, Rotherham were playing MK Dons at the time because I think they were playing there. So I had to get two trains, three buses, two taxis, walk a bit, thumb a lift, uh, and then I turned up at Craven Cottage, the wrong ground. That's a bad start. <laughs> So then I had two tube journeys somewhere else, etc. You know, read the list, James, before you go. But anyway, 
it was, the, it was the last job that anyone else wanted. I think I got paid £15 and no expenses, so I was massively out of pocket. Um, but that, ha that night, a big story broke, and I was the journalist that was there with my microphone and my tape recorder, and I got the interview with the manager that was then on t uh, radio the next day. And from that moment, the key turned to my career, and it was like, right, I've got something now. I exist. I've got something down. Uh, I've, I, people have heard my voice on the radio. This is it. I've made it. Guess what? The phone stopped ringing. I didn't get another job for about three months. Maybe it's something about me. I don't know. But it's just a hard industry, so you need persistence, and you need persistence. But guess what? Persistence paid off, and about six months later, I got a call from a, a chap who I'd met down there who worked at the BBC. Happened to be one of the commissioning editors for a programme called Final Score, uh, which is on Saturday afternoon now, and said, James, could you do a game for us at Sheffield Wednesday? It's on your doorstep, uh, right up your street. We'd like to give you a chance to do it. Uh, oh, God, this is it. I have made it at last. Thank you, God. This is it. I'm, I'm going to be the next big thing. Did the game for them. Don't think I made any mistakes. Went well, went out and on national television on, on Saturday afternoon. Mum text me, yep, yeah, brilliant, well done, son. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, good effort, keep going. Sisters text me, or my pal said, well, I heard you, yeah, it was brilliant. Didn't get a phone call for six months, so I thought, come on, what have I got to do to get a break here? You know, I thought I'd made it, but, you know, th there's, a, there's a proverb about the lowest hanging fruit, which is if you keep going and keep reaching and keep reaching, at some point, there'll be just that apple or that orange or that pear that'll be just there, ready for you to take it, if you stick around longer than everybody else. And maybe I just... Uh, Maybe I just stuck around longer than anybody else. But eventually, I got a job with the BBC, um, working as a football reporter for Final Score. So I was very lucky to basically cover football for the, well, for the past 10 years, from bottom of League Two up to the Premier League. Um, some career highlights have included, um, as I say, interviewing Jose Mourinho, Arsene Wenger. I've not done Alex Ferguson, but I've done uh, uh, Roy Hodgson. I've done Glenn Hoddle. Um, God, I'm going down now, aren't I? I've started so good and <laughs> just tailing off. Um, but listen, basically, I've met some of the great and the goods, and it's been a wonderful sort of learning experience for me, but a really enjoyable sort of job along the way. Um, and one particular uh, afternoon, I was asked to go and cover Barnsley against uh, Ipswich Town. Um, and forgive me if none of you follow football, etc., but uh, at the time, Ipswich Town had a manager called Roy Keane, who was a famous Manchester United footballer. Um, and a famous um, Nor uh, Republic of Ireland uh, midfielder. Ferocious in the tackle, ferocious personality, a real sort of bigwig in the game. But uh, his management career wasn't going so well. He'd been at Ipswich about 11 games and he'd not won a game yet. Um, so, as you can imagine, his team were winning 1-0 at the end of the game and it uh, looks like he was going to get one of his biggest wins of the season. And then guess what? Barnsley scored in the last minute and tore up the uh, rule book and the, and the script. Um, and my editor at the time said, James, uh, we need you to go ask Roy Keane about that. Yeah, it's, uh, it might be a bit prickly, but you're our man on the scene. Um, can you go ask Roy how he's feeling about that last minute goal? I went, listen, I, I might be new to this, but I reckon I can guess how he's feeling. <laughs> Shall I ask him some different questions? No, no, James, just, just st stick with this. And, uh, and this is how it unfolded. So imagine Barnsley, uh, Ipswich Town are winning 1-0. They've not won for 11 weeks. Barnsley score in the last minute, and he gets this jumped-up Yorkshire, you know, spotty journalist on board who, uh, well... Uh, so Explorer. Yeah, we're on Explorer. So basically, uh, it'll come in a minute, will it? Here we go, here we go, here we go. Should already be there. I'm on Chrome, Explorer. Apologies. Right, here we go then. So, imagine this. So, uh, yeah. and it's called the Roy Keane stare for a reason. Um, so, Roy, uh, didn't go to plan. Sorry about that. Um, I'm new to this game. Any chance I can ask you a few questions? I'll start with a bit of a volley. Nice, easy one about the game. And, uh, and action, Roy. It's tough to moment because I, I think particularly we deserve better than what we're getting. And I think the players deserve better than that. And uh, I really can't fault my players today. I thought you know, they had a good goal. And um, sometimes things are out of your control, uh, like decisions which we can't do much about. And people are going to ask me to ask you, are you going to stay on? I refuse to answer that question. We'll take that as a yes then. Take it whatever you want. Thank you. Uh, and what can you say about Ipswich? Uh, I've got to say that that reporter was pretty brave. I don't know about you, I was pretty scared watching that keen stare from me. Uh, not particularly a career highlight for me, even though it comes under section career highlights, but. Uh, Point is, listen, you can't take yourself too seriously in sport. Perhaps you can if you're asking, I don't know, the Prime Minister something particularly difficult. But listen, 
you know, I, I've been wonderfully um, challenged in my career so far, but, um, you know, we are, you must remember that you are paid to ask the question that the person listening would probably want you to ask. So I'm asking questions there on behalf of uh, Ipswich Town fans, you know. Roy, you've just been beaten again. Are you going to stay on? He doesn't want to answer it. Can we take that as a yes or a no? He wants to knock me out, but you know, listen, there you go. It's, ju it's just the nature of the beast. But it's a wonderful career if you can get into it. I'm sure you will, and I'm sure you'll do brilliantly well. And I've been privileged to, uh, you know, as I say, uh, interview some of the great and the goods. And it's been a wonderful sort of passion in me. I don't see it as work when I go watch uh, football and get paid for it. Or at least I didn't. And that was uh, about a year ago when I um, turned gamekeeper to poacher, which ultimately is the nuts and bolts of the, uh, of the talk, from press box to boardroom. So there I am, coasting along in my uh, own little bubble, asking Roy Keane daft questions about you know, whether his team should have won or not. But uh, my team are Bradford City, and I've supported them all my life um, since um, the fire back in 1985, which you, you may or may not know about. That was the first season I started watching them. Uh, one of the biggest tragedies in football history when half of our stadium burnt to a ground and 56 people lost their lives. And that was my team. Uh, and unbeknown did I, did I know at the time that they would take hold of me and just uh, ruin the next 20 years of my life by being absolutely rubbish. Um, but then we had some uh, success getting to the Premier League. And last year, um, I was offered the opportunity to actually work for the club. So having a media background and a journalistic background can open lots of doors for you. You know, some of you will work in journalism. Some of you may go straight into PR. Some of you may work in communications. Um, a whole host of opportunities are available to you. And after about 10 years working for the BBC and going up and down the country doing football reporting, um, I, I read that the then chief operating officer at Bradford City, David Baldwin, was leaving to Pastures New, moved on to Burnley. And the cheeky chap that I am thought, ah, oh, it's a job I quite fancy there. Let's, uh, let's get hold of the chairman. You must know me, Mr. Chairman. I'm James Mason from the BBC. I'm, uh, you know, that reporter who interviewed Roy Keane, and I'm on SAF TV every Saturday afternoon. You need me at your club. Well, not necessarily, son. We uh, need a bit more than that. But I've always, um, as, a, as a freelance journalist, which is how I started, um, I always had to have an extra job, as it were. So I did work in sales for a lot of my life as well, and uh, I actually built a sales company up. So whilst working as a journalist at the weekend, I also had a business. So a role in a football club appealed to me because I had the media side of it, so I could speak to the press and write a press release and maximise our social media presence, but also bring an element of uh, business to it. Because football clubs, whether you like it or not, are businesses. Uh, they're there to make profit and not go into administration which is what Bradford City did twice, um, and hopefully we won't again. But the opportunity came whereby I was um, able to take on the role of Chief Operating Officer, which is a very grand title, and I'm not entirely sure what that title means, to be honest. Um, and I don't really know what I do all day, apart from I look after the day-to-day -day operations, the day-to-day -day running of a football club, which, as you can imagine, as a sports journalist and as a football fan, this is like my dream come true, dovetailing of two, you know, um, real strands of, of my DNA, the media side of it, the communications, the, uh, you know, the inquisitive one with a, a business head, but also my team, my team, the chance to uh, sort of take it to the next level. So I was offered this job on a, on a temporary basis for six weeks, um, and I took it, and I threw all my sort of energy into it. And, and I absolutely loved it. You know, I loved it. I loved the day-to-day -day dealing with the press, dealing with the fans, um, dealing with players, dealing with staff. Um, and it threw up lots of challenges, but my journalism background, I, I, to this day, still think it helped me because on one hand, I knew lots of people in the press that I can call upon as friends. I wouldn't say I manipulated ever what they said, but I could give them a steer as to what stories might be coming up. You know, my job is to put Bradford City on a pedestal in a competitive area such as West Yorkshire and then Yorkshire and the country and then the globe to say, you know, we've got something to shout about and I've got a couple of clips that I'll play shortly that are all about what Bradford City are and what we've done. And over the last year, if you've been anywhere near um, the newspapers, uh, Sky Sports, BBC Television, you will know that Bradford City had a phenomenal FA Cup run last year, whereby we beat Chelsea, the league leaders in the Premier League, you know, European Cup winners, uh, Premier League winners, the best manager going, Jose Mourinho. We also beat Sunderland, another Premier League team. And uh, this all happened while I was there. You know, I was nothing to do with the football side of it, but imagine the opportunities to maximise our revenue on television, to 
sell as many tickets as we can possibly sell, to get our name in amongst sponsors that going forward are going to be you know, really critical for our future as a football club. And again, I still believe that journalism gave me that edge, you know, to ask certain questions as to, you know, Mr. Sponsor, what is it you want out of a football club or, or the match of the day editor? How do we get our manager on your program? So it's been a brilliant learning curve for me for the, for the last year. And I'm just going to play a bit of background as to um, um, something that we did for our uh, social media campaign this summer on the back of this. But does anyone not like football whatsoever? Okay, that's good. It's fine. Um, do you know anything about Bradford City or Chelsea Football Club? Right, good. It's good. That's fine. We'll start at the very beginning. So we're down here, <laughs> and Chelsea are up there. They're the, the pinnacle. They're the best of, you know, of, of, a, of any marketplace, of any league, of any sport. And... Um, Oh, you disagree? Go on then. They were at this time. They were at the time last year. So they were at the top of the uh, Premier League. We were uh, middle in the sort of uh, league, league one. Listen, does everyone remember it? Are we any Bradford City fans in, in the room? Three of us. By the end of this, everyone will be a Bradford City fan. So, listen, so going back to the Roy Keane clip of them, Going back to the Roy, Cle Roy Keane clip, um, Im imagine this scenario then. So I'm, I'm, I'm three or four months into a new job. I'm really enjoying it. We get drawn um, Chelsea in the FA Cup, and, um, and we don't think we're going to win. We think we're going to go down there for a bit of a payday. We were hoping to be on BBC television, but we weren't. They admitted us. Uh, they overlooked that one. But there we are down in uh, West London thinking, this is just a great day out. This is just brilliant. We went down en masse, 6,000 fans, thinking the best that we can hope for is... Maybe three or four nil defeat, a bit of damage limitation. Um, and, uh, well, listen, the rest uh, speaks for itself. So let's see what happened after that. And by the way, uh, the, Pulse, uh, the Pulse is our local commercial radio station. Um, Jason Thornton, who's now, uh, sorry, Tim Thornton. Oh, no, it was Jason Thornton, yeah. Tim Thornton's now at Sky. Jason Thornton, his brother, this is his first gig in professional radio. And Ian Ormondroyd, who is one of our former players, who uh, literally just lost it through this. And he just giggles throughout it all because, you know, this is where sport takes you. It's just a wonderful sort of uh, piece of theatre, this. So here we go. Sit back and enjoy. Again in the bright fluorescent green boots. Here it comes again in towards the near post. Our chance, and it's in. It's turned in at the near post. I think it was Gary Cale who got a flick. There was a real element of good fortune about it, and Williams rooted to the spot. Not a great goal, but it is a goal that puts Chelsea in front. They lead by a goal to nil. Brace is giving it away towards... Ramirez, he's got options, Salah, Salah's first touch should be a tap in, walks in and hits the post and they score a second and City guilty of gifting the opportunity, it was given away by Moraes, they sped forward, three against two and it was a tap in from Ramirez who was a little bit fortunate because it came off the woodwork and crept over the line. 20 forward for the Bantams, here it is from Moraes, in towards the penalty spot, Davis is there, he gets a flick on it, forced to not, back state might be a chance for Stead, edge of the air, he's forced to check it and he's left foot strikes it and scores City are back in it left footed finish from John Stead Chet got a hand to it in the roof of the net and the Bantams are back in it in front of the 6,000 supporters Chelsea 2 City 1 here comes Meredith long throw handsome with a plate half chance all save but score score in front of the City supporters wheels away towards the corner flag it came back to Moraes and against the club who released him? He put City back in it. Unbelievable stuff. We dare to dream. We've got an equaliser at the bridge. It's 2-2. Oh, we're going to play it all, don't worry. But I'm just going to build, build the tension. If this is all we do, I'm going to play this. So it's 2-2 at Stamford Bridge. Uh, so previously, I would have been a sports journalist watching this, watching the story and uh, develop. And you had uh, Jeff, Jeff Stelling, didn't you, yesterday morning? Jeff Stelling covering this. You've got to Google it because uh, he's watching this unfold and he goes, there's been a goal at Stamford Bridge. And that's the first one. And then the second one, he loses the plot. So when we go on and score third and a fourth, sorry if I've given the story away, um, uh, he goes absolutely nuts. So bear in mind, I'm now responsible for the income that Bradford City sort of bring into the club and our exposure. We've just equalised against Chelsea. Um, 
A televised game at this sort of uh, level would be about a quarter of a million pound worth to the club. That's the, that's the fee that you'd receive. Not only that, taking Chelsea back to the Valley Parade or the Coral Window Stadium as, as it's now rebranded um, would again probably bring us in you know, a, a good significant amount of money which would have gone towards about £400,000 worth of, of bottom line profit. So I'm thinking, surely, you know, if we can just hold on to this draw, that's all we can possibly hope for. Uh, and the till would have been ringing, but our team had uh, uh, different thoughts. And you believe it. It's unbelievable. Oh, the Premier League leaders were two up. City would not give up. 2-2 two -two here at Stamford Bridge. Edge of the 18-yard box. Taking on Aspilicueta. He comes across into our stead. Back to go. Can he work? No, and he still has it. The chance. Oh, oh my oh, God. God. Right-hand corner in front of the supporters. City lead. We dare to dream. Oh my God. They are in front here at Stamford Bridge. Who would believe it? This is, is miracle football from the Bantams. 3-2 up at Stamford Bridge. Unbelievable. I cannot get my head. What a move. What great play. Into the feet of Stead. Back to goal. Still has his Stead. Chance for Yates. Wow! 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 In front of the City oh fans, God. it's game oh over. City oh are going to beat the oh Premier League leaders. Oh. Unbelievable. Oh. They lead by four goals to two. The Five. Chelsea fans it's... are heading for the exit door. The FA Cup. Fifth. We'll leave it on that. <laughs> Listen, you're never going to get bored of that as a Bradford City fan, so... Uh, apologies if uh, some of you have seen it before. Apologies if you haven't seen it before. Uh, but in a nutshell, I suppose, th the point we're getting about that is I I'd gone from being a job in sports journalist to running um, my hometown club. And we were the news that day. We were, the, we were on the front page of the Sunday Times the day after. We were on the back page, of the back page of the Sunday Times. And you just can't buy that sort of publicity. So it was quite poignant for me on that day to be... Uh, uh, my wife's only been to one football match in her life. Guess which one she chose? That one. Yeah, she's not been since. She's not interested in Aldershot in the first round of the FA Cup or Colchester on a Tuesday night, but she came to that one. And needless to say, the train back to uh, Bradford Foster Square and Leeds Station was, uh, was a fun one. There was a few drinks had. Um, going on from that, we went on to play um, Sunderland and beat them, dispensed with them as well. Um, and then got as far as the quarterfinals, but we just uh, fell short against Reading. Um, and then it's been back to the nuts and bolts of it for me as, 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 as the Chief Operating Officer at Bradford City, but key focus on, on growing our attendances. And in this, this, this summer, on the back of um, on that wonderful FA Cup campaign, I was given the remit of growing our season tickets. Um, so using social media, which we'd not done before, and it's, and it's obviously a huge um, sphere of journalism now. You know, we've got citizen journalists, we've got bloggers, we've got instant journalism, haven't we? You know, anyone with a phone, phone or a camera phone or an iPad can be that person, you know, Johnny on the spot, as it were, just videoing it, taking it, and then it can go massive. So we were given a budget this year to sell out, to grow our season ticket campaigns of zip, of zero, the nada, nothing, no money at all. You know, we'd have loved to have £500,000 or a quarter of a million or half a million pounds, but at League One level football, you don't have that. So we had to be creative. Um, as journalists, we are creative, aren't we? We have to be clever. We have to work our way around the story. So we came up with a campaign which was very simple. Our chairman, to their eternal credit, decided to make football affordable and cheap uh, you know, and accessible to the masses. An average season ticket in League One, which is the third tier of English football, is about £300, £350. In the Premier League, I think it's six to seven hundred pounds. So it's a hell of a lot of money for anybody. And bear in mind, if if you were to go with your partner and maybe two kids or your grandfather and your grandmother, you know, we're talking thousands of pounds. So our chairman said, right, James, the stadium is 24,000. We're getting 12,000 at the moment every week. We've just had the best FA Cup run ever. Our name is in vogue. How can we inspire people to buy a season ticket? We'll do our bit. We're going to make it 149 pounds for an adult. Six pound a game. £6.47 if you're going to be pedantic. Um, but a lot cheaper than non-league football, way cheaper than anywhere else in the football league, up and down the country, probably in the world as well. Um, so they gave me that. So that was the hook, and I thought, that'll be enough. I think if we use social media to its best and use our Twitter followers, of which we've got 45,000 and 80,000 Facebook followers, 
we can create something here. We can create a bit of a zeitgeist about what it's about to be a football fan, what it's about to be, you know, um, a football fan at the lower leagues, as it were. Yeah, we've beaten Chelsea. We've dined at the top table, but, you know, we're a grassroots community-based club with, with uh, ideas of, of grandeur. We're up, upwardly, upwardly mobile. So we sat in the office and thought, right, campaign, 149, in bold letters, hashtag 149. How can we get people to retweet this, to get involved in it, to engage in it? So we were having kids making 149 in the spaghetti hoops and sending it in via Twitter. We were having a Huddersfield, uh, Bradford City fan cutting his, uh, his neighbour's lawn. He was a Huddersfield Town fan and piling the grass into a 149 um, sort of collage on his grass. We had all sorts of things that we could do. But again, going back to my journalism background, I thought if we can just create a story around where we've come from, where we've been, where we want to go, and ask people to buy into the next step of our future, that might be more powerful than any marketing campaign that we can come up with, you know, with Saatchi and Saatchi or whoever it might be. Let's, 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 ha let's harbour the people that we've already got, those that were there when we were in our first and second administration, those that were there when we uh, beat Chelsea in the FA Cup, but a couple of seasons prior to that, we got to the Capital One League Cup final. Let's grab them, but let's get the next generation. Let's tease people into thinking, do you know what? I want to be a part of this. And this is the sort of really exciting part of my job now whereby I can use a journalistic head, I can use a little bit of creativity, I can use a business head, but I can really use social media, the tools at your disposal, to, uh, to get something really special going. So I'll finish on this before we have any questions, but this is where we're at as a club. And this is, you know, something that I think I am very proud of, every Bradford City fan should be proud of, but everyone that's... Uh, I think a journalist, because I think this tells a story, and this is amateur journalism at its best. A couple of guys in my office, I gave them the task, I said, go away, they're the nuts and bolts of it, you go create it. Put it to music, let the picture paint the words as it were, you know, just follow it through, and uh, even if you're not a football fan, see, see if you can understand what we've tried to do here. When you try your best, but you don't succeed, When you get what you want, but not what you need When you feel so tired, but you can't sleep Stuck in rivers And the tears come streaming down your face When you lose something When you love someone, but it goes to waste, could it be worse? Lights will guide you home and
Thank you. Watch it again. Yeah, so I mean, something we were quite proud of, but we used um, mobile phone footage from fans that they sent in. We used, obviously, stuff that was on the BBC and Sky, etc. Um, and we just tried to create a campaign that was very socially inclusive of all our fans, past, present, and future. Um, and it's just a good example of... Um, of, of what can be created, really nothing more than that to some extent, but we were keen, we were key to use, you know, hashtags and messages to, you know, to basically let that do the story and then let, let, let it go viral, you know, let people pick up on that, whether you were a football fan or not, whether you were a, a, a Liverpool fan or an Aldershot fan, you got the message that this is where we started, this is where we, we've been, this is where we're going to go, come on board and be a part of it, so... Uh, that's where we're at pretty much. Uh, our FA Cup campaign starts um, again tomorrow night, so it's one full circle. You'd all be very welcome. Uh, and as I started at the very, st as I said at the very start, there will be prizes. You can come to that game or a game in the future if you've got a question. So I think we've got ten minutes left, haven't we, Jan? So is that right? Another ten minutes. So if anyone's got any questions, um, fire away. We'll go left to right. Yes, mate, at the back. Um, how difficult is it? Right, okay, yeah, good point. Um, I suppose I come to it differently in that I, I was the gamekeeper that's now turned the poacher. So I was the guy asking Roy Keane the difficult question, and now I'm here probably protecting our manager from certain ones. So um, I'm able to use some of my skills to sort of guide the journalist into what Phil, our manager, might want to answer or not. But equally, you know, ask Phil... Phil, are you happy to answer these questions? So I've only got one club that I can speak authoritatively on, but I do know it's difficult for other press officers and chief execs at other places because, um, you know, there will be prickly situations. Jose Mourinho at the moment has, uh, you know, has caused a bit of a storm at, at Chelsea. And, of course, when things go badly for you on the pitch and if, you, if your profile's up there ready to be knocked down, I think it's particularly difficult. Equally, at lower level, um, you've got a much more... A closer, intimate relationship with a local journalist. So, for example, if you're at the Halif Halifax Town and, you're, and you, the local journalist from the Halifax Courier relies on you for information and stories, that relationship's got to be a little bit different. It's not as um, as protected at, at a higher level, but it can be very difficult to answer your question. And I think you've just got to use a little bit of your nous, you know, a little bit of common sense in terms of, you know, when to change gear through things. When the when the you know, listen, when you win football matches. Any question, you know, throw them at me. You know, it's no problem. When you're losing football matches, that's when I think professionals, uh, whether you have a media background or some other background, that's when you earn your stripes, really. So it can be very difficult, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. You know, I think about it every day, to be honest, um, because, as I said, when I started, it was very much a, a transient, temporary sort of scenario. Um, and like a football manager, I suppose, um, you know, you're probably only as good as the results that are behind you. So if we, if we keep performing on the pitch, but I don't maximise our opportunities or our revenue, at some point someone's going to go, well, these figures aren't looking so great. So it's very much me, uh, you know, it's very much a scholarship for me, almost an apprenticeship. You know, there's not, lots of people in my position are either accountants, solicitors, some former journalists, lots of former players or business people. So I don't think there's one particular skill set that lends itself to a role in football better than any other. Uh, I think I certainly have some key elements that work, but I don't I have an accountancy background, but accountants may not have the sort of media sort of contacts or, or interests that I do. But I do class myself as a journalist. That's what I train to do. That's my training. Uh, so I would imagine, you know, a plumber that goes on to be a have a big building firm can always fix U bends and stop leaky taps. So, you know, if uh, if it all ends tomorrow, yeah, I'll be knocking on the BBC's door and saying, "Remember me?" And they'll probably say, "Nope." <laughs> uh, oh yeah, you were the guy. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, Roy Keane. Yeah, that's you. Uh, but again, I probably have to start from the bottom up. But yeah, I'm, I'm a journalist. I'm, I'm like you guys. I'll, I'll never change. That's what I am. It's what I do. Hiya. Do you know what? I never did shorthand. And I really wish I'd been taught it because, so I did a bi-media course, uh, so predominantly radio and journalism, uh, uh, television. 
And I really wish, if any of your tutors out there, it would be a skill that would be so crucial to me now. So, for example, court reporting, uh, press conferences, uh, more so now when I'm in meetings with agents and solicitors or, um, or other individuals who are writing contracts. You know, to get the facts right, the facts are sacrosanct to the contract and to the story. Something I never had. Maybe it's because dictaphones became uh, more prominent. I don't know, but I think it's a skill that you should all have uh, and work really hard at. I see me at a disadvantage to people that have it. That have it. So very, very important from someone who doesn't have it. So there you go. Yep. Sorry. Um, the, uh, the the knockbacks and the and the and the thinking, will I ever bloody get a job? You know, it's really hard. Some of my friends had to give up on their their dream um, because you know it's such a competitive industry. You know, that look how many of you all want to be in this industry, um, and the reality is that not everyone will make it. I'd put a spin on that and say everyone can make it possibly. But, you know, they give up. I don't know if you've seen, there's, a, there's been a program about the SAS on over the past four weeks. It's been brilliant to watch because it is just about, not necessarily the survival of the fittest, but those that just keep going till the very end. You know, so we start with 40, knock down, knock down, knock down. The guys at the end, the ladies and the, and the gents at the end are the ones that just pick themselves back up. You really need a, some strong belief. You need to listen to your tutors if they tell you that you're good enough. You need to listen to your peers that will probably say, oh, you're talented, keep going. Um, and then you just need to know it yourself because you're going to get, you know, some, I, I, I think it was a good six to nine months before I got that first gig with Real Radio. I was working in bars and this, that and the other. And it, I suppose it's like being an actor or a musician. If you speak to a musician, going back to your question, then a couple of my pals were, were in the um, Kaiser Chiefs. So when we all were building careers, they were working in McDonald's or doing whatever you needed to do in call centres, jobs that they would probably class as not careers and, you know, probably unfairly dead-end jobs, because they were musicians. That was their training, that was their vocation. And they, and they became musicians, paid musicians, but they're always musicians. They'll pick a guitar up and play it, or drums. So the knockbacks. Uh, but you'll, you'll get there, you'll do it. Yep, sorry. Uh, championship for definite, maybe even Premier League the chairman are watching or if anybody else you know why not I, I, I am I am the eternal optimist but I think we've got grounds to be optimistic if you look at that journey that we played you know beginning of you know the 2003 season you know we were at the rock bottom of league two we were going out of, um, of business fast forward 10 12 years or so we've been to Wembley twice we've beaten Premier League teams along the way we were the first fourth division team to play at Wembley in a major league cup final uh, we nearly beat um, Reading to get to the FA Cup semi-final. We've got 18,000 season tickets. So when, when I said we had 12,000 last year and the 149 campaign got us an extra 6,000, you know, we're really aiming for the top. We're upwardly mobile. So the championship, certainly within three to five, five to seven for the Premier League. Now, you asked me how important Phil is in that. You'd probably hate me saying these things because, you know, we try and, you know, don't want to overplay things. But, you know, I think every year he's been there, we've improved. Um, up until last year, you know, it's still improving. So we finished just outside the playoffs last year. If we finish in the playoffs this year, we've improved again. So he's, oh, he, he is, he is, he's our Jose Mourinho. He is the key to all our success, um, as well as the backroom staff, as well as the players. But, you know, he's the manager, so he's the driving force. Good question. I'll go over that side. Sorry, mate. Yep. Um, Bradford fan. Yay. Yeah, it happens. Leeds United under Ken Bates banned a couple of my friends. So Alan Biggs is a well-known journalist and, you know, his job and his belief was to ask certain probing questions about what was happening at Leeds United. He wasn't getting the answers and he was banned by the then chairman. Um, listen, it's a tough one because it's the club's prerogative and now it's more a case of with social media that newspapers are, and traditional media aren't as important as they used to be. A football club probably could exist without its news, local newspaper. It could probably exist without its local radio station because they can do everything in-house, they can do it themselves, but then they can also control what goes out, if that makes sense. So we could just pump out 
you know, rhetoric all day long and saying, this is what you should be listening to, this is what you should... Be. We're, we're playing really well, even though we've been beaten 4-0 for the past 10 weeks. So I don't think, uh, with my journalist hat on, uh, you need local sports journalists, you need local newspapers and local radio stations to, um, you know, to, to uh, keep some sort of perspective on things, um, to keep relationships going between the players, the manager and, and the fans, because how often do fans get to ask the club and the players questions they want to ask? So a typical question would be, you know, how well did you play today? Should you have played him or should we be doing this, should we be doing that? So. Um, I'm all for it, but I'm now paid to sort of protect our club from certain things. But, you know, I think, I think we're a very open club in that respect. You know, we hold our hands up when we make mistakes. We made some last year. I did. We all do. So I think it's a symbiotic relationship whereby you need it, but, you know, it's not as important as it once was. But I, I actually think it, it, it is. Yep, sorry. Yeah, good, good question. Yeah, I, uh, we made some wrong decisions last year because of our success in the FA Cup. We got some ticketing issues wrong, whereby they were, we were oversubscribed for tickets. Okay, that's not necessarily our problem, but how we dealt with it, you know, we got some things wrong at the time. And um, being a fan of the club hurts more than ever in that respect. So I wouldn't say, we, do we make emotive decisions? No, I'd, I'd like to think we're professional. We make decisions for the benefit, ultimately, of the club. But we're just transient, we're just holding the bat on now for the club going forward. So we've got to make sure that no matter what, the club's in a better position tomorrow than it was today, and it will be next year than it is now. Uh, we've two chairmen that are mad Bradford City fans, and if you think, if you flip it on its head, yeah, most chairmen do make emotive decisions. They pump money into a football club that they wouldn't pump into their own business, you know, bad over bad, because it's the wrong thing to do. Um, it'd be interesting if I ever go and work somewhere else, if I feel like I'm more professional, and actually my predecessor, David Baldwin, has gone to Burnley, and he now feels like a professional in a professional environment, because before, everything hurts, everything's painful when you lose, uh, and everything's maximized when you win, so, uh, brilliant question. Uh, the answer probably is a bit of both, yeah. Sometimes you can't separate the two. That's the right thing to do, but I want to do that. Yeah. Yeah we've, yeah, we've got two Wiley chairmen that have been around the block in the business lives and in their football lives. And as I mentioned earlier on, we've had two administrations. So Jan will tell you, Bradford City nearly were extinct. We were close, seconds away from, you know, the administrators saying enough's enough. And look at Northampton Town now in our league who could go out of business within the next month. Um, so we're astutely aware of the finances. And I think uh, what you can learn from what were classed as yo-yo clubs, like West Brom and so on and so forth. If you cut your cloth accordingly and operate as a business, I think you, uh, you'll be all right. But yeah, it, it is worrying. You know, I think Millwall or some other clubs you know, will, will post losses of 10, 12 million pounds last year. We made money. We've made money the last couple of years. Yeah, don't get me wrong. It's, we have to be frugal and we have to be, uh, and we have to be aware of our position, which means we can't always invest in a new scoreboard, which would be great to have a big scoreboard, you know, but scoreboards don't score 20 goals a season, or they haven't yet since I've been involved in it, so fully aware of it, uh, and it, you know, it's a worrying marketplace because there'll be a lot more clubs that go bust over the next few years. Yeah, good, good question. I think he was asking right at the back, that guy. Um, I'm in no rush, so we can... I am. That, that is a brilliant question because my wife asked me that just last week. She said, with skin. Uh, <laughs> she says, if you do well, will you please take a job at another club? Do you know what? Honestly, at this moment in time, um, I can't honestly answer it because going back to the emotive question, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm part of a project. I genuinely do feel like I've got a bit to do and I'm still learning as I go along. Um, It'd be great to be in the Premier League with Bradford City one day would be the perfect answer to that. Um, listen, money talks at the end of the day, but no, at the moment I, I've got a job that I've, I've, I reckon I've got a good few years in me yet. You know, I'm going to see us there in the Championship and the Premier League if the chairman will have me, so. 
Of course I'd take the money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's what, sorry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, we did it before. Uh, okay, that was the Premiership then, um, and we did. It. And Blackpool have done it in recent years. Bournemouth have done it in recent years. You know, they didn't spend as much money as people thought. I think if you look up and down the leagues, those that spend the most money generally win. So if you look at last year in our league, uh, Preston, Bristol City, MK Dons, they had the biggest budget. They went up. You're right with the uh, with the Championship. There's always a few quirks that. Throw, um, throw anomalies in there. So I think you're right. You do have to spend big to get the best players and to get up there. Um, tough one. Yeah, we will. I think the way for clubs at our level now would be to cup runs will help, but they're sporadic and you can't budget on them. Selling youth players, I'm afraid to say, is, is one route to market. You know, stumbling across, um, you know, a real gem of a player. You know, Leeds United have had a good sort of track record of bringing players through. We have as well. Tom Cleverley was one of ours. Uh, Fabian Delph at some point was with Bradford City. Um, Andy O'Brien going way back. And, you know, so you're right. It's going to have to be big money to get us there. But uh, we'll worry about that when we get it. <laughs> get there, hopefully. Yeah. Yep. Far back. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. T so that, that chap and that chap then. Yeah, sorry. Oi. Um, yep, so the 11th of May, just to bring it into context, that was the date of the fire back in 1985. So every year, and this is the 30th anniversary of it, we, uh, every home game we uh, recognise uh, those that lost their lives and importantly their families as well. So in terms of doing it justice, I pr I'd, probably, I'd probably change the phraseology there to just say um, a poignant remembrance of it, if that makes sense. We don't. It's, very, it's a very hot topic at the moment in the press, as you'll, as, as you'll be aware. But we're, we're very dignified as Bradford City fans and as a club. As I mentioned before about being stakeholders and being sort of transient baton holders, no one at the club worked at the club back in 1985. None of us professed to have a, a, a forthright opinion on how we should remember it. So what we do is we throw it out to the fans and the families that were involved at the day, on the day. Um, we have a minute silence, bang on three o'clock, we, we lay wreaths before the game um, and then we open the ground up as well for fans and their families to pay their own respects. So doing it justice is, is probably not the phrase I'd use, but I understand exactly where you're coming from in that respect. Uh, we just do it in our own sort of private way and we will do that until the end of time as well. But it's, very, it's a very difficult time as well because we were asked to be involved in uh, a number of documentaries um, last year. Um, and now a simple response is, listen, we don't own any of the footage of the fire. It's out there. I think uh, ITV owned the footage. Um, but no one, in, no one individual, no one um, organisation um, owns the right to whether it should be shown or not. So we, uh, we just, we just uh, stay out of it, to be honest. You know, we couldn't make the right or wrong decision, so... No, I think we answer, I think we ask, as a group we ask some silly questions. You know, Richard Horsman again taught me brilliantly ask an open question. You know, don't ask a question that can be a straight yes or a no. So, you know, um, um, you know, are you disappointed with the fact that you lost today and your player got sent off? Of course I effing am is probably what he wants to say. Um, so but you know, the job it, listen, sports showbiz now, so if if, if, the, if, the, if the interviewer is wanting to get a reaction from Jose, they'll ask certain questions. But listen, no, he answers his own questions as we all do. So, he, yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> is that it? Okay, yeah. Okay, um, no problem. Just jump in, uh, you know, kind of like the side, which obviously I'm not as many as you <laughs> Yeah. Know. 